Um, you probably already know that it's the originally it wasn't called CFS CARP. It was called Experimental Army Signals Establishment, and so the sign said. And you in fact had to have a little sticker deckel in your car, and you were, of course allowed to come into that outer parking lot before the the little guard room, and you could park there as long as you had that sticker and you had insurance to back it up. So it said E A S E on it. Little deckle boat so big, stuck it on the windshield. And um, up at the front, there was a, uh, a large sign in the field. You came along that little carp road and came in, guard room was there. You parked over here. So you came in there, and standing there in the field was a big wooden sign that said Canadian, um, something about Canadian Army, something or other on this wooden sign, Canadian Army Establishment or some words to that effect. That's what was there. And I don't think that sign changed much for quite a long time. Not until they started changing the names of the units. They called the signals part of the building uh, CARP Signal Troop. Downtown, we were still part of the organization downtown, which its headquarters was one, Cana one Army Headquarters, and that's what it was called, One Army Headquarters and Signals. So this, in our language, it was One Army Signal Squadron, and then you'd break it down into smaller subsections, and they were called troops. So we were in CARP Signal Troop, and we went out there in January. And downtown was Ottawa, and they were based in the, the basement of the old temporary buildings in Carche Square. So I first was down there for a little while, and I think I had been sent there in anticipation that CARP was going to open, so I was there on hold. I really didn't do very much down there because I wasn't there very long. I was only there about, it wasn't even a month. And uh, when the place opened, we went out, and we all went out there on buses on the given day. And uh, they had the, the bus line, of course, was D&D, &D, and it, uh, the depot, for this bus service was located on Catherine Street, which is not far from where the current uh, Voyager bus terminal is. It was down right near Bank Street. Uh, so that's where it all originated from. They had a, a service corps garage there, a big one, and it, I think, went back to wartime. Beaver Barracks was just opposite there. That's where a lot of single people live. So there's the where the bus thing was. And it went on a route and we were eventually given a schedule and it went to certain places along the way until it got way out around Crystal Beach and then it just went on out to Carp. Every shift was able to travel on that if they wished. Now some were too far away from the designated stops and they took their own vehicles. That was only for the Ottawa crowd. There wasn't any bus service for the people in such as uh, Elmont and all the outlying area. Uh, that, and I'll mention here, of course, that the transmitter site, T1 Perth, you're familiar with that at this point. That crowd there, they, they were separate. Most of them either lived in the area or they, they looked after themselves, but they were part of our unit. And as an aside, on that switchboard I operated, it had many fancy gizmos on it. And if I wanted to just press a lever, I could talk poof, and send a to T1. And I could, in fact, make a PA announcement from where I sat in CARP and would quote over the site at, at the transmit site if I wanted to do it. Uh, or, if, you know, I wouldn't just do these things, but if there was a reason. They were responsible for their own defense up there, and they had their own organized little defense course under the commander. And the commander was a W01 CWO, as the ranks naming changed. At first, it was a W01. And they were predominantly technicians. That's who pretty well were up there at that site. <clears throat> um, they also have. Uh, had receive antennas there in that field. You could see them, a uh, fence around the outside, but um, really nothing to stop anybody that wanted to look at them. And if you look at an antenna long enough, you can figure out what they're used for. 
it's not any it's going to be much of a secret because you can't conceal it. Um, you'll know it's going to be long range HF and stuff like that. So when it comes to classified things, well, about the only thing they might not have known was the frequencies. But um, if that's where you bring your cipher and stuff comes in. So you can transmit on them at will using online crypto equipment. So that was all. Uh, we talk about sometimes the worry about classified uh, material and everything and the whole effort was classified. Well, yes, to a certain degree it was. The activities inside there uh, were beyond a doubt. But as to the purpose, and you had to be pretty clear what the purpose was, why it was there and with the fact that when the hole was dug and, and there are photographs around showing various evolutions of this thing, uh, and it was quite, a, people with binoculars could quite easily observe this stuff. So uh, they could see and, uh, and knew, especially with the uh, Charlotte Street not that far away. You know what's on Charlotte Street, don't you? Still there today. So I'm sure there was plenty of, ob of observation especially with it on the side of a hill. And you could see that in those days, you could see the door from the highway. Well, um, so we, we arrived and of course we had briefings and there in, in the site, there was about three distinct entities in there. One was the signals element commanded by a major and we say troop, but we used to use troop then for large bodies of people. They would now be called squadrons, and subsequently they did call them squadrons. But in those days, a troop could be 130 people, maybe, say. As time went by, a troop would be like 30 people. But then we had the camp commandant. That would be the site commander, another major. In this case, he was an infantry type. I believe his name was McDougall. And I think he was RCR. Then we had the NSAWS, which was the National Attacks Warning System. It was commanded by a brigadier. And that was located, I think, on the, doesn't really matter specifically, but it was on one of the lower floors. And uh, that's where they did all of the uh, plotting of uh, sightings, uh, both uh, air and sea and uh, people that worked in there uh, and handled that nitty-gritty were senior NCOs, um, uh, quite a few artillery, and they were called plotters, P-L-O-T-T-E-R-S. And they would plot these sites on the map of the world. And down in that place, we had our own separate uh, teletype station, so that on our system, you, you call these little things tributaries, uh, meaning you have a major site and then you have little tributaries going here and there all over the place to other little sites, lesser sites. So they had their own little station sitting right down in there. And it had its own uh, address and they did their own communicating right out of there over our, over our system, which was called the Canadian Army Signal System. That's what was on the sign. That's what was on the wooden sign, C-A-S-S, Canadian Army Signal System. So that's what we went there for, was to support that, that thing. The satellite came a little later, down the hill there a bit, the NATO, um, NATO, NATO, uh, can't remember the exact, um, abbreviation for it. Anyway, was the satellite was actually NATO ground. So when we did our defense of the site, that was included. And they did their own thing down there. It was commanded by a captain. Captain Bacon was the last guy I remember being there. And they had a bunch of uh, senior and chosen techs, radar types, radar technicians, radar operators, and a few others. But mostly that's what was in there in that great big white ball, you might remember, inside of which was antennas and things. 
So that was that was there. Also, we had um, certain communications uh, um, hot points that were outside the the wire that we were responsible because they were classed as vulnerable points. So we had to make sure that they were they they were uh, these vulnerable points were taken care of. So when you had a a base defense force uh, plan and a base defense force exercise in anticipation of a, of a possible real thing, you had to have, uh, that had to be all included in your, in your plan so that you could protect it to the best ability that you had with the resources that you had. Meanwhile, I had to keep the whole thing working. The whole site must continue to work. So it means you're, you're stealing from the shifts all the time. Also, uh, there was also the, uh, the problem of uh, sometimes people getting upset about uh, things they thought we might be doing there. As you know, uh, any, any, uh, any DND site is susceptible to uh, public unrest. They become unhappy with either wages or they might become unhappy with policies or things we may do or what people think we should do. So you have to be ready for public activism, it can be violent or it can be non, it can be passive. So you had to be prepared for all that. So the B, the base defense force, commonly called BDF, had a fair amount of responsibility. The responsibility was compounded by the fact you had to, um, you had to have your people sufficiently trained to meet the contingencies that might come up. So that meant you had to cover a lot of variables here various events, the possibility of them happening. And it included male and female, uh, some of which were pretty, they were quite lightweights and a little bit uh, out of their element in that they weren't used to doing things like that. So it was a bit of a task. And uh, so once a year we would train, do what you call dry training, that is classroom type training, explaining uh, teaching, and then you'd you would have uh, an actual exercise in which you implemented the plan to the best of your ability, and see how it all turned out. So you have to do that at least once a year. So that was that's that part there, and that started um, base defense force actually started around 1970. That's when that sort of thing was implemented after the FLQ crisis. And uh, so that's about the start point all across Canada when those things started to emerge as a, as a DND policy. And it became quite important. Mm. So I'm, I've jumped around a bit, sorry for that, but let's go back to 62 when we went out there. That was immediately after the October crisis or shortly after, was it? 1970 was October crisis. Oh, sorry, October. October. The Cuban Missile Crisis. Like Cuban Missile Crisis happened in the fall of 62. Yeah. And that's why my posting was in December of 62 because I was held there until the coast was clear and then and then those that were um, supposed to be post had been posted earlier on in the year uh, were able were allowed to be posted. So it was unusual to post them people in December. It's not not a normal thing. Well, they do it anytime they want, but it's not normal. Mm -hmm. So that's why that happened. It was in the fall, the fall of '62, and uh, I can remember going home on leave at that time in preparation for going to Europe. And when I got home, my brother's ship was called in and they loaded their munitions in Halifax and he was in and out and gone there. I was on leave and uh, preparing to go, but nobody uh, was allowed to go anywhere for a while. And we were on a pretty much of a full alert at that time. We were, uh, it was in a, it was a serious uh, situation and uh, most of us knew it. So were you, sorry, were you in the bunker then during? Oh yeah, I was in the bunker, yeah. Yeah, but I was on, on I'd happened to be on leave down in Nova Scotia when the balloon went up. When when the the challenge was on between Khrushchev and Kennedy. And uh, so I finished that leave and went back and we just carried on until the coast was, you know, they came to some agreements and the doomsday clock backed off a hair. 
and so they uh, they uh, allowed us to be then to be posted to where we were our intended places that we were to go. They didn't affect very many people on that particular site. Um, in the, to get down to the more, I guess, um, social aspects of life in the hole, everybody lived in, you know that now, at that point, everybody lived in that was single. Or if you had just been posted and your family was somewhere else, you could live there for a little while until you got your family moved. But these um, these rooms, of course, had no windows. And um, there were a lot of people in there. At first, there were a lot of troops in that hole. I couldn't tell you how many, but the records would probably show you somewhere. Uh, a search of the National Military Archive would reveal some of this. But there were a lot of single people in there. It was predominantly army. It was an army thing. Um, I'm not saying there was never an Air Force or a Navy uniform in there at that point, but I don't remember seeing any. They might have been. There were a lot of civilians in there. We were still actually building the place. It wasn't completed. And when it went into operation, and I can remember watching some of these things that went on, and I can remember putting through these long distance calls for uh, the companies that put that strad in there, signals transmitting and receiving device that stands for, uh, British made uh, in Bristol or someplace, um, very expensive thing, and they would make uh, telephone calls. They were civilian people right on site. They, they had their offices right there. They'd call, make a long distance call. We got very much used to them. We had to go through the little switchboard in the village of Carp. It was a private exchange. So they had private exchanges in those days, owned by the uh, Ma and Pop sort of an organization down there, right in the village, put through the call. They got a piece of the action each time it happened. And, um, but they facilitated the calls that went out all over the place from there. And, uh, we would have to get time and charges in all these long distance calls. And uh, they were quite expensive. The ones being going to England, I thought were quite expensive. You know, you're talking a, a few dollars every time they made a call, even in those days. And this, they, they were quite frequently done. Um, we also used to have uh, a lot of um, dealings with such as uh, Renfrew, uh, Arn Pryor, Smith Falls. We had uh, little uh, communication, so I guess we'll call them sites, but the, that conjures up a big thing. They, they were small. But we had uh, places like that that we were connected to. Later on, this became a part of emergency government, Some a lot of these things, and there a lot of them were located in post offices and such. But uh, I can remember vaguely the uh, switchboard numbers and things that we had to call there do, do, when we did that thing. This thing was uh, a switchboard that pr uh, provided a lot of different uh, services and uh, we were put in that switchboard because this radio control center that I mentioned later wasn't really up and running yet. So, but they had the people, but they didn't have the facilities ready to go. So they s put people like me into that switchboard. So we were actually, I think, somewhat overborne in operators in there, more than what they really needed. Um, and, and, and when you consider the, the level of supervision, we had a, a surgeon uh, major, that would be a, a WO2 level, there as the boss, and there was a surgeon below him who was one of our supervisors, and there was a bunch of us corporals, and this is when corporals were corporals, you know, before the rank system changed, and a, and a number of signalmen. Too many and too much rank for the job because of course, a private soldier can handle most switchboards once he's he's shown he can do it. 
But that's what we did in anticipation of this radio control center opening up. That that job was the job I did the second time I was in there, because in there, then it was up and running. You walked, um, let's visualize a switchboard with 10 positions. That would be for 10 operators. You plug your set in, and put your earphones on, sit down a bunch of keys with your, your wall of uh, holes to put your plugs in to make the calls. And um, so uh, with a seat and by each, but one, most of the time, you only really needed two there operating. And oftentimes it was only one uh, could handle it as long as things didn't get too busy. There was a lot more uh, manual uh, operation of such things in, in those days. And this continued on up into this up into the uh, second tour, it was still going like that. And later on, it became much more modern in the in the 70s. But the, the layout was a switchboard, 10 line, 10 position board, with some other fancy little gizmos for this PA business and all. Door went off through there, through what they called a, a rack room. Now the rack room would be where all the many, many, many wires for teletype and radio, that would be radio and, and teletype integrated, working together, and then the telephones themselves. The, all this wires was on huge racks and people could just walk around through these racks and all the wires are exposed so you can easily repair them. And you moved on in a little further, they had a little room where the testing and the maintenance was done mostly through observation of meters and things. So if something went wrong, you see, this was just a very small room. And right off of that was this radio control room. It was quite large. And in there was all of the um, monitoring uh, stations. And initially what we did, we had some live stations and visualized two systems. One would be a backup. One is radio, which just doesn't have many hindrances because it goes through the air. The backup was landline. So we had radio as a secondary thing because the landline was the most reliable and we're, we're in a position of being at peace. So we had this. And you can still do your, your uh, uh, security on both systems. So we did, we had them both going. And what we were doing was we were monitoring uh, a number of frequencies and these were very carefully uh, recorded and logged 24 hours a day on all these many, many circuits. I can remember having one down to uh, some weird places, Fort Leavenworth, you know, why did we have a station going to Fort Leavenworth? But we did and Fort Bragg, places like that. London, we had two to London. And um, the, actually the city, uh, the site was called Boddington, I think it still exists today, at least one of them does. And um, we, we monitored them and sometimes used them, but they were being monitored so that we could find the best frequencies for the best time of day to use. So that's uh, what was going on in my second tour. Um, the STRAD, the, sig the signal transmitting and receiving device, was the, it was the matrix. It was the center of the Canadian military's communication system. It was the hub. Everything emanated from there. Its call letters were RCCA. And uh, if you ever look at the big, huge matrix on the diagrams that you've probably seen some by now, because it's not really classified, you have the ball here with RCCA and everything else emanates off worldwide from there. <clears throat> so, um, in my first tours there, the uh, people who worked in the, the Strad, and here the Strad, was the, I guess it was the catalyst that drove everything else for the comm side of the house. 
it being the center of everything. Um, we called it the Canadian Army signal system as far as the, uh, the landline, teletype landline, and it went all across Canada and off over into Europe. At the same time, you could use radio, as I already mentioned, if you, if you wanted to. Um, later on, it became the Canadian Switched Network, CSN, and the new terminology as things got a little more modern. And during the period, if I'm not getting muddled up, during the Cuban crisis in 1962, we were still called Canadian Army Signal System. And sightings by uh, aircraft flying out of, uh, I think some may have been from such as Greenwood Coastal Patrol, aircraft which we still have today, probably a different type of aircraft, but the um, aircraft that flew out of such as Limestone, Maine, they were in the air 24-7. We had, we had aircraft in the air. I'm trying to think of what we called that. That was, the, uh, that was for our early warning defense for this continent, for North America. That was part of the, in case there were ever any uh, interlopers ever came over the, the Arctic regions coming from that direction, we had these aircraft up also watching the oceans. And so whenever there was, a, and we had our distant early warning radar line and you know all about the various levels we had of radar up there. Uh, much of it, of course, gone, but um, three different levels of it, starting with the dew line. They would s report sightings, and when, a, and when a sighting came in, whatever else was going on in the strad came to a halt as far as pr priority. A sighting was, and we had, uh, we had precedence uh, uh, words to indicate this was high precedence, and flash. So if you got a flash message of a sighting, it didn't matter if that came in. If you had a whole bunch of other stuff that had this, and a level on it of immediate, that took a back seat. You just dealt with flash. And sometimes these, these flash messages came in very, very rapid succession. They might be air, they might be submarines. And sometimes a lot of it was done just to test us to see if we could deal with it. It was done, done by the Russians on purpose to agitate us. They just playing with us, submarines and stuff. But a lot of it was serious stuff. And it was just sightings that we happened to see. So if you saw, uh, Let's say we had the aircraft was in the air. We could have our aircraft from, uh, say, uh, Daggettville or Gold Lake. They might sight Russian aircraft that intruded into our space. We called them bears. Uh, a Russian bear was a type of aircraft doing the same darn thing as the ones that a limestone were doing. And uh, just loaded with electronic equipment. Just loaded. They're watching us, and we're watching them. That's the Cold War, watching all the time. Sometimes there were accidents. Sometimes things happen. You read about it in your education. Uh, you read about some of those incidences. And we will never, ever know, you and I, probably what really took place. I think somebody somewhere knows, but you and I don't. Things took place. Submarines went down. They, they uh, were never seen again. Uh, both ours and theirs. So, and sometimes there were aircraft incidences too. And there were quite a few people on these aircraft sometimes because they were large. 
Um, after some time after the uh, so-called Cold War, we'll say, ended, the wall came down anyway. Um, eventually, these uh, 24 hours a day aircraft didn't fly 24 hours a day anymore. Um, I think since 9-11, things have changed again. But I've been out of the military, and I'd only have to be able to speculate, so I can't. Uh, I, I, I know some friends that have flown in them uh, since then. Um, the thing was, when the sightings came in, they came to us. We had to send them immediately and deal, we had to action them. And a lot of it went to the brigadier there with the plotters. That's where it went. And he was where the buzzer was, the brigadier down in the bottom of that hole. So if it got too, too bad, I wouldn't have wanted to bring the brigadier and make the decisions. Well, that's what it was all about. That's what that hole was for. Government use in the event of a nuclear uh, attack, uh, either planned, anticipated, what have you, or actually happened. It was never was really tested. It was exercised. But I think the hopes of having our prime minister and the BBC and certain ministers in those rooms, I had to put the phones in those rooms one time, I'm sorry, I didn't put the phones in. The phones were in. I had to put the numbers on the phone, on the phones, because I was in the switchboard at that time. Uh, I'm not so sure how successful they would have been, but that was the plan. It was as near as they could come to a safe haven to maintain our government as we know it where it would be protected from radiation. But I always was concerned about air. And I had, when I was the BDF commander, I had to be concerned with all of the things such as air, because the people in the hole were going to be susceptible to chemical as well as poison. You know, there's various types of contaminants that you can do, water. I was always concerned with that kind of a protection. And when you look at it in a, from a serious light, like it has to go, when, when you're responsible for something and you know that the care of others is, you know, somewhat hinges on how you handle these things, you take it pretty darn serious. And I know that, you know, air, quality of air, uh, vulnerability to uh, contaminants was was much in my mind anyway. But as to how well we could have done if anything had happened, all I could do is practice and, and hope that I had had all the things in place to stop such a thing happening. And Did you feel like that was a real possibility, a nuclear attack? I had to uh, treat it as if it was. Yeah. Yeah. We, we did a Every, I imagine lots of your people you've talked to have told you a lot about that period of time. We had a great uh, emphasis on uh, nuclear attack in this country at that time, in those days. And we did a lot in preparation for it, for uh, um, rubble and um, nuclear contamination. Um, casualties, which would be huge numbers, and all of those things. It was a tremendous emphasis to put on it. We spent a lot of time on it. Uh, yes, it's a long time ago, but the, the generalities are very much still with me today. I handle a lot of it in that archive where I worked, stuff we did back in those days. But it was, it was um, it's good training for civilian times even now in the event of, let's say we had a Tsunami, much of the same things apply. That, that uh, large numbers, no facilities, uh, what do you do? 
because you're always used to having facilities and all of a sudden you don't. Mm -hmm. So that's what you got to be ready for. There's only going to be one person do it. If you're alive, you're it. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah, treat it quite serious. Did you talk ever with any of the other staff members maybe about, did anyone have a sense of anxiety or concern about that kind of thing? I don't, I don't remember anybody ever having a sense of anxiety. It's funny how humans are. They sort of accept say, well, this is the way it is right now. And no, I can't remember hearing uh, wives or civilians talking to me a lot about it, but there was certainly a lot of it in the, there was lots of it in the media. My goodness, there was lots of it. Lots of people looking for communist spies, everything in your hip pocket. You know, there was a lot of that went on. That was going on in the 50s, mm -hmm. you know. The most famous, of course, being down in the States when they looked for everybody under the sun. What was his name? McCarthy. Yeah. Senator McCarthy. And a lot, a lot of that stuff did come over because there was a lot of uh, spy activity in our country and in the States. It was going on from both sides. Mm -hmm. uh, that's when you had the Kilby and all the stuff from England and uh, I can't remember all those names, but all of that stuff, Burgess, that's that period of time. And if you were, I would think that people who were um, higher ranking officers of the day, you know, in the general level, I would think that it was a, a, quite a heavy responsibility. We had a lot of emphasis on uh, our North in those days, a tremendous amount of it. And we were very active in the North. We did a lot of experiments in the North, not just signals, others. And some of some of our Canadian types became what you might call winter experts. And uh, I, I myself went up there and took the uh, Winter Warfare Specialist course myself in, in back in 1961. But it was done because we thought that the next war, World War III, would happen in a cold climate. And CARP is all part of that big picture. CARP, uh, DeBert, um, Val Carche, Camp Borden, Shiloh, and um, we had one up in Edmonton, Penhold, it was. I don't know if I named them all. But anyway, that whole network was put in there to maintain, to keep our country together in the case we were attacked. That's why it was there. Mm -hmm. And that was our readiness plan. And we were told what the policies were being. And it was our job to implement them. Yeah, the same as the Americans had silos and all kinds of things out there with missiles buried in them. It, it was all part of that. And if you just went down below the Canadian-American border in such places as, let's say, Montana, Colorado, wide open spaces, hard to believe, and you come across some little insignificant little site and there's a missile in there, ready, pointed that way, pointed north. Mm -hmm. So they, you know, yes, they were going to have their war, maybe, but that war, I'm, I'm pretty certain I would just... All I was was an NCO at that time. But I'm certain that they planned to have the war over Canada, northern Canada. Radar, early warning devices and systems are designed to tell you as early and as quickly as possible if a threat is coming so that you can retaliate as quickly as you can and keep it as far away from where you are as possible. And we've done that on other times. Wars have been fought in other places, but I really think that they were... The, I think that they thought if they had hostilities, ever, if they ever did break out in these talks over arms limitations and uh, limiting the arms race and this heavy stuff that they were getting ready and they had tons of it both sides 
the plan was that it was going to happen over northern Canada. Mm -hmm. And that would have spilled down into the lower parts of Canada. That's why we had the three different levels of radar. Mm -hmm. And we gradually closed down the, I think it was called the uh, Pine Tree Line. And they were not, that's not far from here. You're talking, uh, yeah. you know, just up here. They, they closed those first. Those are the first to go. <clears throat> and they were closed in the 60s. And um, like the um, Sioux Lookout and Dana, Yorkton, and all those radar sites, and they're pretty far down. They're, they're way down there. You know, I mean, you can run down to the border quick from those places. They were only closed in the 80s. Think of it. So this threat's been here, and they weren't too going to be too quick having they having built them. They weren't going to be too quick about getting rid of them in case they ever in case they needed them. So they were manned right up until the 80s. Um, Jor. Um, can't think of them all. There were many of them, all the way down, clean down to uh, St. Uh, what is it, St. Margaret's or Barrington or someplace down in Nova Scotia. I can't remember all the place names anymore. But that was all across the country, and that's all part of that. Mm -hmm. That's why they're there. So, I mean, do you believe that this was going to be maybe World War Three, possibly? I mean, how did that affect your? Day-to-day? -day. Well, that's, uh, yeah. Well, in my life, it was something that was omnipresent, but you didn't talk about it because it was understood by most of us that that was the world that we were in. Uh, and we knew that we were supposed to be as... Um, trained up as we could be in anticipation of that maybe happening, and we did a we did the best we could. Of course, there's always that big hope that it'll never happen, and that's the big hope you always have. But in those days, there was there was that possibility. I just don't think that it is the nature of maybe most humans, but in particular people in uniform, they don't talk about it a lot. They don't complain about it a lot. They know about it. It's like going to Afghanistan. You know what's there, but you don't go griping about it. And you don't say, oh, poor me, whatever you do. You don't, you just don't even, you don't think like that. I think in human nature, there's always a thought, well, this is going to happen to me, you know. I, I really think that most people don't think about that. You don't think about it very much until the crunch is on. Then you, then you might think if you had time, you might think a little bit about it, but mostly no, you don't. No, you don't. I, I never was nervous about it. I just thought if something goes wrong here, I'm gonna do everything that I have been taught to do that I know I should do. I'm gonna do the very best I can and do my part so that um, I don't let the whole team down, and it won't be because of me. That was the hope. That's kind of how, you, how I think that's how most of us did, you know. I never really talked about that ever before. Uh, I, it's just something that's kind of tucked in the back of your mind. It's not something you express, you know. How did you and the other people that you were working with uh, feel about the rule about not being able to bring your family in if there was an emergency? I didn't think about it much at the time. I thought about it afterwards. And it wasn't the only time in my case that I thought about it, but I didn't think about it much at the corporal le level. My part of the world was pretty small at that level, uh, and which I think it would probably be the same for most of us at that rank, signalman, corporal, even maybe sergeant. Um, the more you get involved, the more you learn, the more you, the more the more you know, the more you think about things, and you say, "Hmm, only certain people are going to go there." Even I didn't see these with my own eyes, but there was at one point in time said to be. I, and I emphasize, I did not see, but there were a couple of coffins in the bottom of the bunker in case we had casualties. 
but of course there wasn't much storage room. And they were down around where the small arms were kept, which was actually in the vault. They had a huge vault because our, our money was going to go in there. Canada's gold was going to go in there. Or whatever we had to back up our currency was going to be in there. And that's where we kept the weapons. That's where Lordy got the weapons from. Uh, so we, I'm drifting from one of your question a bit, but we knew there might be casualties in the hole. They might be from various reasons. They could be from somebody who'd been in there too long or something happens to them. And um, we had military policemen in there 24 seven. Um, as to who would have had, fortunately nothing ever happened. The nearest thing to it was Lordy. And that was pretty late in the game at that point. We had an outer guard room and an inner guard room. I had, a, I had a fellow that I knew, you may have heard about him. Maybe it happened more than once, I don't know. One fellow came in, past the guard room, came up the tunnel, went into the chamber, shut the door. Now he's in the chamber with both doors shut. And he had claustrophobia. Never did, never did complete his posting into the site. Couldn't stand it psychologically. Couldn't stand those quarters, especially when they closed the two doors on him and they were very thick. I, I would think I'm about that thick, the doors. And when it squeaked shut, it was shut, boy. But there was a little glass you could th look through. You could see the MP sitting inside. And they pressed, once you were cleared, they'd open the door and in you went. But first they closed the back door. When they see that everything is fine, there is no escape once that door is shut. They'd open the door and let you go into the site. That was just, you come up, the tunnel was off to the side. The tunnel actually went up, slight up grade, I don't know, about 30 degrees maybe. And you continue on out through the back, you came to a fence with a locked gate and in behind was a, was a sort of a social building. You've probably heard about that building that was contributed by the company called A.D. Ross, who uh, was one of the main construction outfits that built that place. Not certainly the only one, but one. And they donated their, their building and each one of us in 1962 had to donate a day of his time to go over there and tear out walls and stuff and turn it into a, a club of sorts. I remember I did my day over there. Helped smash out the wall so they could put a bar in there, which served not only liquor, it served pop and stuff. Because we didn't have any canteen on that site. Down in the kitchen, this you've probably heard much about this. I hope not. I don't want to bore you. Um, there were a lot of people. There was a lot of people in there all day long. There was no night. Of course, there were no windows, so the lights were on, but there was no night. There was always people up, and a lot of them. The kitchen served four meals a day, just as if it was noontime every day, every meal. Um, they had a little piece off the side where the brigadier and some of those guys ate, but I can remember that part being there. I saw them from afar. Um, but we were, we were all cohabitating down in there. And there was, they ran movies. They served beer. They didn't serve beer all night. I can't remember if they ever did it for a little while. There's a possibility they did for a little while. But I wasn't in there 24 hours a day. Only when we had exercises was I there 24 hours a day. And even then I would have been outside some. I was never one of the ones that had to stay in there. But some of them stayed in there and didn't want to go out, especially in the winter they didn't want to go out. And they had to be forcibly made to go out. Because if you stay in that little room too long without daylight, and it's not good for your health, both physically and mentally. So, But some, some of them just didn't go out. And there's a matter of hygiene, too. And hygiene's important in a place like that where you first of all for yourself but also for those you live with 
you know, and so if you want to have an enemy, <laughs> don't be clean. But there, I can remember them being in there, all ranks and all swarmed in there together in this one particular area. I think it was on the, probably on the second or third floor level, they call them levels. And um, guys playing cards, might be a film on, kitchens open, a lot of people sitting around just talking, having a beer, uh, doing all these things when they weren't on duty. And uh, if you were, it, when you had your little break period during your, say, eight hours, you, you'd go down, you'd get your, your hour, half hour, whatever you could spare, you got to exchange with other people. So uh, I can't remember what it was, half hour or an hour. You'd go down there and you know, I, I, it, just, it was just the way everybody lived down in there. And everybody seemed to get along. I never did hear of a row down in there. Never. None. None in there that ever came to my attention during my tours. Um, over in the other place, I don't know. Can't speak for that. But not inside. After a while, they stopped all this living in. The rooms were there. And some people use them for some of the time. But the... When I went there in the 70s, I don't think anybody was living in anymore. I don't think they were there living in permanent residence. They lived downtown. And the, but, the, but the unit in numbers had got smaller. This NSAWS was not there anymore. It wasn't in there. This, this brigadier wasn't in there anymore at that point. As far as I remember, I don't think it was any there anymore. At least not the way it was when I was there in the sixties. Mm -hmm. We had a big. It was a big, quite a big organization then. I'm sorry. Were you living in when you were there in the sixties? No, no, no. I always lived out. Okay. And the only time I was ever in in there was when we had uh, a base defense force exercise, and then I would go and we would have it run for whatever a day and a half or whatever length of time it was. Maybe three days. I can't remember that for sure now. Enough to test ourselves that we could deal with most instances that we we anticipated might happen to us, including riot control and stuff like that. That was in anticipation of a bunch of Jabonis coming down to the main gate and raising King with us, uh, maybe peacefully or not peacefully. Did no. that happen then? No. no, not while I was there. Not. I'm glad it didn't. Um, some people want to protest. They might be just protesting about something else, you know. For example, I can remember them. As an aside, I was out in um, where we do our gas warfare training, uh, Medicine Hat. I forget the name of the camp. There's a camp. That's where British train. It's it's just it's just north of uh, Medicine Hat. Ralston. It's called Ralston. Mm -hmm. And um, went down to the headquarters one day and one of, one of my friends was there and said, well, you can't go in there right now. It's a great big tent, marquee style. And uh, well, the walls come down off a of marquee so you can look through the little crack here. I looked in. He said, you can't go in there. There's a bunch of protesters in there. So I pulled down the thing a little crack and looked into the protest. There were a bunch of ladies from the nearby town had come up here to protest that we were using gas to kill people with. We weren't. We were using it to train to protect ourselves against others that were going to use it on us. So, uh, in, in other words, it was defense against it. That's what we were training for. Anyway, they were in, in their heaven with somewhere in their hats and this is, this is back in 1968. And they, um, they were, uh, had their little say, I guess. I wasn't a witness. I saw the aftermath. It was all very peaceful. And they, they were all sitting around the table having cake and coffee and tea and everything was fine. I guess somebody explained to them, we were running out to gas everybody. <laughs> so, but you never know when somebody's going to protest some darn thing, especially in the military. You have to be ready for it. And 
hopefully keep your cool and don't don't do anything to make it any worse than it already is. And it falls upon somebody to go be the spokesman and explain all this if they get an opportunity. So that's what, but there in, uh, in CARP, in the day-to-day -day operations that from all that time, from 1962 when it officially opened, January the 6th, I think was the date, right on up through until they closed the place, I don't think there was ever uh, an incident where somebody would be there protesting beyond civil servants, maybe protesting pay, you know, strikers, stuff like that. But it wouldn't be the type of a thing where the, you know, where you'd have to call out the BDF in real life. You were just, what we were doing is we were preparing in the event that it was required. Or if you head into Lopers that came there bent on doing something that they shouldn't, you know, we have sabotage. We were open to sabotage and you had to be on the alert that it didn't happen on your shift. So that's why we had it. Uh, but in 1962, we, we rode the buses, all us living downtown, the ones that were single, they lived in, all during that year, continued on right up. They were still there when I left in December. In 1965, in June, I came back. Life was pretty well the same. The bus was still running. I just moved back in and did the same thing I did before, except the job changed. Um, used to be a stop out at Carlingwood, in Ottawa. My stop was at Brunson, Bronson and Carling. That's where I caught the bus the second time I was there. Uh, the, the first time I was there, I caught the bus at Bronson and Carling. Sorry. Second time I walked over, I lived over at uh, Maine and Hawthorne. I used to walk over to the bus start point by Bank Street, so I could walk over there. And uh, that's how we all did it. There were a lot of people who used the bus. It was a good thing, really. And then they stopped doing that. And as I recall, in the, in the 70s, they brought it back, but it was only for it wasn't for married people, it was just for the single people. They had a smaller bus, probably a 20 passenger type, and it was it was single people riding that bus. Yeah, somebody influenced it to be brought back on again. And it went from, it started in Rockcliffe, former Air Force part there. And it uh, that's where I know that it came from. But um hope I'm not wasting your time. Um, could you tell me a little bit about uh, what your family's response was to your work at the bunker? Like, how much did they know about the bunker and what could you tell them? I didn't tell them anything. Um, no, because the, bur bunker, the bunker activities were classified. Uh, didn't matter what you did there. You weren't to talk about it. Um, I, I don't know if anybody ever said much, but you weren't supposed to. Were you ever asked by anyone, like people who lived in town? Or, or I had people bring up the subject and then they'd speculate and trying to get a response out of you. But you just don't. You remain just stay non-committal. Don't, don't say anything precise. I'm just working in there as an operator. Don't tell them. And uh, I guess you, well, you just talked to DeNoble. He did, when he worked in that one area there, it was basically the same job as I did, only we called it Radcon. He called it facility control, that being the new name for it. Um, you just didn't talk about it to people who didn't need to know. So that's, that's the way you keep it. It's not heard, really. No, no one ever bothered me about it. 
that I recall, used to go down to the barber shop in the village. Yeah, you probably heard about him. He, he sold tombstones as well. <laughs> so, you know, everybody went down to the barber shop. My goodness, I don't think it was a, it, I guess it was a dollar. It was a devil's his name. Didn't have any running water. He had a little, little wooden shack right at the crossroad there. We'd go down there and get our hair cut. He sold tombstones, sold hunting licenses, anything. <laughs> it was really an old folksy place. They had a little bank in Nova Scotia there. They used to show a movie in my first door. They used to show a movie down there. And uh, at some, you know, must have probably been Friday or Saturday night, I guess, was the big night in Carp. And um, there was a restaurant. There was a restaurant there that a fellow that I uh, I knew a little bit. He was married to a German woman from, Ger of course, from Germany. <laughs> no, wouldn't be a German woman from France. And uh, he was an ex-serviceman. He bought that restaurant and turned out to be a pig in the poke and he didn't make it. But um, I guess they filled the restaurant with all their friends until he bought it. I used to go to his place sometimes till they clo he closed up. He gave up. Yeah, so that was <laughs> right down there in the where the crossroads was, just on the east piece of the corner. So I remember that being there, but there wasn't much in the village of Kerr. I never ever did see the house where the switchboard was. I don't know where it was, but somewhere's there. And you went a little bit south of there and there was a little airport. One of my guys was learning to be a pilot down there, ex-infantry guy that I had, His name was Crawford. I don't know whatever became him. He was learning to fly an airplane. They had a co-op down there. That was a nice little store. Standard co-op sold just about anything in it. Just uh, well, half a block off the main street, the main road. So we, we, you know, I've been in there some. I never really had need to go beyond the, uh, the, the bank. I've been, was in the bank. Not much, but some. People were always um, friendly there. I never experienced any difficulties with any of the people around there mm -hmm. in that community. Actually, it brought employment in for people in the surrounding district. A lot of the civilian people, you know, they worked there as maintainers and uh, uh, cleaning, food, things that went on on the outside of the hole as well. You know, so it brought it brought a, uh, a little bit of prosperity to the little, the little village and surrounding district and Dunrobin and places like that. But uh, there was a lot of commuting. A lot of people lived in the valley towns. Mm -hmm. I can give you one name. I'll slip you a name. Mm -hmm. Poye, for, uh, Stan Poye, was one of the first guys in the hole that wore a uniform. He was an old friend of mine. He was a operator like me. But one of our other jobs was to work switchboards. And when they were building the site, he worked the, the what we called a field switchboard, called an F and F, fixed and field switchboard. He worked one of those boards in that hole before the site was ever activated. So he that's who was in there. And I don't know. I saw him over the years. He'd now be 75 or so years of old if he's still around. But he was one of the first communicators went in there to work. And he was in there, well, I guess the building was starting to develop. We called it a building, funny enough. It was called the building, even though it was a cement thing and underground. Um, so he was, he was in there. I thought I'd mention that to you in case you didn't know that. And the linemen, a number of linemen were there in the very early stages and they lived uh, in the Almont, in Almont, and a, lo a number of them lived in a little motel on, I think it was on 17. You go to the village and go east, there was a little old motel up there on the left hand side. And a lot of them used to live in there during the week when they were there working because there was a tremendous amount of line work had to be done in that building. 
Okay. Oh, un good. underground and, and so on. So that's where what Lyman did in, over there. And they dug it in all over the place. So I didn't, I hope I didn't waste your time. Not at all. Definitely, definitely not. Um, are there any sort of last stories that you like to tell about the bunker or uh, favorite memories from your time there? Uh, there seemed like there was always some kind of intrigue going on in the hole. It was just like uh, Peyton Place stories. Uh, I'm not talking about uh, off-color stuff. I'm just saying there's always some kind of intrigue going on in the hole. So yeah, there were lots of funny things. We had a guy who played with the books one time. He got nailed. I thought he was a good guy, <laughs> but he got caught. Stuff like that. But no, it was it was all right working there. I didn't mind being there. I didn't really want to go there after I'd been there, but uh, that's where I was. So. One interesting thing about that last job is that when I was a corporal, I wasn't allowed to go into the room. And in 1973, I went back and said, you're responsible for the room. I never had any training in between. <laughs> says, now, you run it. Don't make mistakes. Before that, I could just look at it from way over by a counter. I, I could look through the door. That's how we do things. 